Uh, good evening and welcome to the British School and to the second of this year's lectures accompanying our annual master's course in the topography and archaeology of the city of Rome. Our speaker tonight is Nigel Spivey, who is senior lecturer in classical art and archaeology at Cambridge University. Nigel began his career as an Etruscologist and much of his doctoral study of Etruscan black figure pottery was carried out in Italy at Pisa University and as Rome scholar here at the BSR. In fact, when I first met Nigel at Graham Barker's excavations in Tuscania, uh, he proved a hard taskmaster on site, but an excellent guide to the jet set beach resorts of Monte Argentario. His many publications include monographs on Greek art, 1996, and the classic Etruscan art for Thames and Hudson in 1997, as well as the ancient Olympics, 2004, and Greek sculpture for CUP in 2013. He's also made several excellent television documentaries, foremost of which was How Art Made the World for the BBC in 2005. He's currently working on the afterlife of the Euphronius crater, uh, which we found was not on show at Villa Giulia last week, having returned to Chevetri. But tonight he previews some new research on Roman art in a lecture uh, with the intriguing title and subtitle, which I have here, Looking Like Caesar, a case study of personal likeness and group assimilation in Roman portraiture. Would you please welcome Nigel Spivey. Can I begin by asking, do we have any experts in Roman portraiture here? <laughs> or anyone who's prepared to declare themselves as such? Um, not that that's going to change what I say, but um, in a course for the city of Rome, um, there is some generality here, and it would be boring for you if I were to tell you things that you already knew about Roman portraits. Um, so perhaps if, when I'm sketching in some of the background of this, uh, it's, it's common knowledge. Maybe I'll be able to see from your faces whether it's um, time to accelerate uh, and ditch and go on to another part. Um, is this about the city of Rome? Well, not strictly speaking, obviously. Um, the uh, Caesar is the, is the connection. And when it comes to Caesar, it says something about my education that almost immediately doing a talk about Caesar, I want to divide it into three parts, uh, as Caesar um, famously divided his... Um, conquered Gaul. And I thought we should start with um, something that, uh, with an object that is relatively recently part of archaeological discussion about what Caesar looked like. Um, are we, are we, how many of us are aware of the finding of this in 2007 from the River Rhone. There are some nods in the audience. Uh, for some of you, maybe it's the first time you're looking at this. Um, look at it briefly now. We're going to come back to it. I put this up because it tells us something about the degree of wishful thinking that there is in the study of portraiture and in the study of the portraits of Julius Caesar um, in particular. Um, that is to say, not everyone agrees. This is, there is no consensus that this represents Julius Caesar. But such is the wish on the part of the archaeologists who found it, um, who are based in the Museum at Arles, that on the back of their conviction that it is Caesar, it does represent Caesar, the French Philatelic Bureau have felt no academic compunctions about declaring this to be the bust of Caesar. Um, and if you think about it, this is a remarkable thing to do from a sort of, you know, the point of view of national pride when one thinks that, you know, this man I think is reckoned to be responsible for the deaths of something like half a million Gauls. And you put him up as, um, you know, a, a hero on, the, uh, uh, on an envelope. And I think it says something about 
the, the will to want, you know, to want to see uh, someone's features in a head that you pull out of a river. Uh, and as an archaeologist, you know, it, it's, even if you're not an archaeologist, you can understand how um, important that, that wish is. <coughs> so we've got three parts, which um, uh, I will subtitle as, one of them is going to be about the idea of a person, which is um, a concept that is, I think, uh, a major part of this, this inquiry into whether a portrait can be, as it were, affixed to an individual. <coughs> uh, the second part is a sort of case study with um, a head that, uh, even for people who do know a lot about Roman portraiture, may be a novelty. They might not have seen this one before. Um, and I came across it almost by accident, um, actually, in a small museum in Umbria. And then, thirdly, I would like to come back to this question and come back to um, the image from, from Arl and try and do something conclusive with it. And I should warn you now that it's not going to be terribly conclusive. But we are going to start with another Frenchman, Marcel Mauss, who is the only image uh, of the many images on the screen. They're all dead white European males, um, I should warn you. Uh, and he's the only one with any facial hair, uh, Marcel Mauss. And he, if you don't know him, he's, uh, I mean, he's best known as an anthropologist. And um, in particular, he um, impinges on this because uh, around about 1938, he gave a lecture um, in London, which was a very bold lecture, and he admitted it as being um, you know, the sort of thing that was trying to do too much, but that wasn't going to stop him doing it, and I admire him for that. Um, and it was um, a very compact history of the idea of the person, cross-cultural, as befits an anthropologist, and I mean, his, his um, talk was a summary, and if I summarize it in the sort of two-minute version, it goes something like this, that once upon a time, the term persona meant mask. And what Marcel Mauss showed was that, and I think most anthropologists agree with him, was that the idea of a person as a, a masked individual within a society, i.e. not an individual, but someone playing a role, that idea um, is, is something that can be, I mean, he found it in a number of um, cultures uh, in, the, in the South Pacific mostly, and that's where his documentation came from. Uh, and so that's a kind of pre-modern idea of the person. And it has nothing to do with individual identity, i.e. in a society of this sort, you take on a mask and that is where you get your name from. So this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's horribly summarizing what he points out. Where do we get our idea of the person as a personality from? Well, Mauss identified a particular time and a particular place where this happens. And for him, it happens here in Rome, or in central Italy in particular. And it happens around the late Republic. And his evidence for this is um, his reading, and he says he's, he's very candid about this, you know, I'm not a Latin philologist, but from the writings of best known, I guess, would be Cicero, and in particular the Cicero text that, um, I mean, he doesn't do any kind of detailed exegesis of this, but he's thinking about Cicero's ideas of the person being an individual in a society who has certain moral, legal um, duties, which then becomes, um, spans us into a Christian understanding of what the person is, and he takes the story up to a sort of modern psychoanalytical idea of the personality, which is, you know, and he says you go from 
person as a mask into person as a as a legal sort of status thing. Slaves are not are not persons. You know, that's a famous aspect of um, a part of Roman law. Um, and then he will take it up, and he did all this in French, so he's going to end up with the idea of moi. I am my own person, and I am the, you know, the one and only Nigel Spivey. And all of you are one and only versions of yourselves. Yeah, that's the kind of psycho, uh, psychological understanding of this. So you get an idea of what Marcel Mauss is trying to do. And it seemed to me, reading this, um, that... Uh, it was time to have a look again at what was happening with the study of Roman portraiture because at first sight it looks very promising, this idea that it's in the late Republic and it's in the writings of you know, uh, someone as articulate as Cicero that you get this idea of the true nature of an individual. Now he wasn't interested overtly in, in the effects upon portraiture but as I'm sure some of you are aware, there is a phenomenon happening in Roman portraiture which gets the name of, um, people will know, it's called Verism, <coughs> sometimes with a, with a capital V. And I think the term Veristic is, is almost now exclusively reserved for these sorts of portraits, mostly as far as they can be dated, from the first century BC, mostly. And uh, to a large extent, they are anonymous. And, uh, well, the name, in a sense, says it all. Verism should mean that you are getting, in a sense, what Marcel Mauss wants you to say. Um, incidentally, the, uh, I haven't entirely renounced um, Etruscan interests and there's a kind of subtext to this, that there is an, a, there's a masked figure that you see in Etruscan tombs um, named Fursu or Persu. And the Oxford Latin Dictionary, if you look up persona, will say that that's a plausible, not a definitive, but it's a plausible etymology for the Latin persona in the theatrical sense, that it's a masked in the person. Um, but, but, but Cicero is kind of departing from that, uh, according to Maus, and giving us a, a different sense of person, i.e. someone who's not wearing a mask and is showing their true nature. And you look at these veristic portraits and you think, you know, someone wants to go down to posterity looking like this. And a bit of you thinks, well, you know, they, they must really have wanted. I mean, this character on, on our right... Um, from Osimo, uh, I think is the is the most extreme example that I've looked at, um, and almost it's almost incredible that someone could wish to be portrayed like this. Um, well, I could spend the rest of the uh, rest of the allocated time talking about verism, but um, the bad news is that the there is a consensus about verism, which is. I think shared by um, many, many colleagues, uh, and it's, again, summarizing this, it would go something like, actually, this is not what it seems to be. And verism is, is not a good name for describing this phenomenon because it's a style. And it's a style that can be affected. And the implication of that is that our man from Osimo, or I mean, often they're just given uh, generic names. I mean, this character who, um, I think he's in, uh, either in Dresden or may, may have moved to Salzburg, but anyway, he's just called Altaman. He's just called the old man. Uh, often, I think this chap is just called um, Vecchio Ignoto, you know, an unknown old man. And sometimes they're given um, uh, characteristics are often um, described uh, uh, in Roman handbooks as patricians, and without any uh, uh, epigraphic evidence for that at all. Um, and I've seen uh, one of these described as boorish, as if the renunciation of classical style, i.e. looking young and athletic and beautiful, were in itself a kind of assertion of, uh, uh, of some kind of you know, anti-classical, anti-Greek, um, 
uh, bias on the part of the subject. The, um, I think, still highly respected uh, Italian um, art historian, um, Bianchi Bandinelli, um, he, often, he had a lot of pupils who've gone on to do great things in Italian uh, art history, Bianchi Bandinelli. Um, if you look at what he writes about these portraits, in a sense, he, um, he shows, and without, he's, he's not referencing to Marcel Mauss at all, but he shows, um, in a sense, that, that he anticipates the tendency now to say that these represent a class. They don't represent individuals. These are not necessarily reliable indicators of what people look like um, uh, in these portraits. Uh, and Bianchi Bandinelli goes, I mean, he's, you know, he was a, a fairly um, die-hard Marxist, and he, he classifies um, these two within a group of um, anonymous portraits from the, from, from the Republic, late Republic. Um, and he, he, he sort of, he says they're all followers, they're all optimates, they're all followers of Sulla. And um, I mean, I, I do have a text here, which um, I think I, I've chosen not to read it, but it does mean I'm occasionally going to have to rummage for things that I um, can't remember. Um, verbatim in my head, um, but if you if you check out his uh, comments, Bandinelli's comments on this, it's that this is a group of anti-classical, anti. Well, they're sort of uh, I mean they're monsters for him. They are um, they're devoted. I mean he calls that they're, they're devoted to killing, saccheggio. Um, they, they 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 form this group identity of people who are. Um, yeah, sort of hell-bent on destruction, and this is their way of representing it in their facial features. So we have a group identity here, and almost immediately the problem for us, um, as people are interested in portraits, is how can you have a portrait representing an individual that also represents a group identity? Something, it would seem that something has to give in this, um, in this compromise. Well, Bandinelli didn't use this term, but uh, in a more nuanced and modulated way, um, Paul Zanka has talked of the Zeitgesicht. Um, uh, I think the term was first used by um, a predecessor of his called uh, Bernhard Schweitzer. That's as far back as I can take it. Um, it sounds a little bit like um, the... Hegelian idea of a zeitgeist, you know, a spirit of the times. Um, and there may be people in this room who at the word Hegel shudder with, uh, with horror. Um, he's, not, he's not a la mode. I don't think he has been a la mode for a very long time. And this idea that you can classify an epoch with a spirit of the age, a zeitgeist, I think most historians would be very wary of doing this. Um, and it seems to me that it's natural to be a bit skeptical about a zeitgesicht, a look of the age that people affect. Now, Zanka um, mooted this idea with regard to, um, and incidentally, if you want particular references, um, I do have um, them. Uh, print out a list of these if you, if you need them. But there was an essay book by Zanka about um, this statue uh, from, from Pompeii. <coughs> in the Naples Archaeological Museum of Holconius uh, Rufus. You know, he was what one might uh, idiomatically call a big cheese in Pompeii. Um, whether he deserved to be wearing quite such a grand military cuirass uh, may be debatable. Um, but Zanka's uh, idea about this was that whilst he wasn't denying that there are certain portrait features of Holconius Rufus, who was a, a priest of the cult of Augustus, and you know, the inscription says a certain amount about him. Um, in his eyes, the, the individu individuality of Holconius had been sort of transformed into a general assimilation, and um, I can't go into all of the details here, but the the, the arrangement of the hair, um, again, one could spend hours talking about 
uh, flock and hara and the, uh, the way that hair is disposed. Um, there are features of the, of the mouth, um, and more, more of these will become apparent, so excuse me if I uh, hasten through some of these. But basically, he identifies certain features of both Augustus and Augustus's um, adoptive uh, father, Julius Caesar, uh, in this portrait to moot the idea that there's a Zeitgesicht here. There's a, there's a look of the age, and for fairly obvious um, uh, political reasons, it was, it was good for Halconius to assimilate himself uh, to um, the Julian clan. Um, and as I say, this, this I, th I think instinctively one feels that uh, this somehow defeats the object of a portrait. Um, i.e. if you're walking down the Via del Abondanza and you see this statue, uh, you surely were not supposed to think that this is some kind of doppelganger of Caesar or Augustus. Uh, and in which case, if, if you did think that, it would be um, rather counterproductive. Um, but in a sense, there is no denying that there is some kind of um, assimilation here. So I think it, it, it's our job this evening to kind of focus in on what it is that's going to make someone look like someone else. Um, and it's, uh, as I say, it's, it sort of defies what Marcel Mauss is proposing. So for the second part, which we're at now, um, I'd like to take you to um, up the Via Flaminia and to stop off at Spoleto and to look at... Um, a base, uh, a pedestal in the museum at Spoleto, which was hailed by Sir Ronald Syme as the, I think his verbatim uh, remarks would be, the most remarkable inscription ever set up uh, in honor of a Roman senator. So, I mean, it was a strong term that he used for um, describing this. Um, and some of you may be familiar with, with Syme's writings and many writings on Roman history and prosopography um, and know that he's not the easiest scholar to, to read and a certain amount of telepathy is needed to, uh, uh, or clairvoyance to understand you know, when he says this is the most remarkable inscription and then leaves it at that, um, I'm afraid uh, we have to do a certain amount of work to say, well, why is this so remarkable? And uh, I'm not um, highly skilled in epigraphy, but I do um, have the advantage of seeing almost on a daily basis um, a woman who uh, in her mid-90s is still as good at Roman inscriptions as she ever was, Joyce Reynolds, um, who has helped me out with this. And I said, you know, Joyce, what is, what is remarkable about this? I mean, it's a statue to a Roman senator who um, held some priestly offices, so he was one of the... Um, Septem Viri Epulones, uh, he was Curio Maximus, you know, is that what his Pietas is all about? You know, he had to do, arrange festivals, etc. He said, no, no, it can't be that. Um, uh, he wouldn't, you wouldn't use Pietas for that. Um, and yet it's very obvious that the, the Pietas of this character, uh, who as you see is called Calvisius um, Sabinus, um, I think is uh, one, one thing may have just gone off the edge there, um, there. Uh, was a Patronus, um, and he was also a consul. Um, Ronald Syme says he thinks this inscription, on the basis of the lettering, which I can't dispute at all, uh, belongs to um, around, about, around about 39 BC. Um, I like the way he says around about circa 39 BC. Um, and Joyce thinks it, it yeah, that's, that's credible. Um, um, well, actually, I've, in, in this text I've got here, I, can, I could, if you want to know, there is, uh, um, there's quite a lot about Calvisius Sabinus in various um, Roman historians. Um, would you like to hear about that? I think we probably ought to, actually. Um, so he's, Calvisius is um, actually first mentioned by Julius Caesar in his commentaries, serving as um, a legate in Aetolia in 48 BC, Seems to have become a praetor, served as governor of Africa Vetus in 45, um, has various doings with Mark Antony, um, becomes a consul in 39, and that's presumably what this refers to, 
um, given command of a fleet against Sextus Pompey, um, called upon to suppress brigands on the Italian mainland, uh, and documented by Plutarch as uh, Kaiseros Hetairos, a companion of Octavian. Um, so he took Octavian's side against Antony, and after Actium, he became governor of Spain, returned in May of 28 BC victorious, and became um, uh, a via, via triumphalis, so he had a triumph. And with the spoils of his triumph, um, he did with, uh, which, something which I wish people would do today. Um, those of you who go on Italian roads wonder why there are so many holes in them. Um, and it, we need Calvisius Sabinus. He came back and he upgraded the Via Latina um, with what he'd got from Spain. Um, so he basically starts off as a baggage handler. And Syme characterizes him as um, the typical uh, Noah's homo, you know, someone who started modestly but made it good, mainly thanks to being on the right side and um, being with Caesar. Um, but Syme doesn't actually say what the Pietas was all about. <coughs> and it's a very conspicuous element of this inscription. And uh, it takes some tracking down, but you'll find it in uh, an author who, who may not be one of your bedtime authors, Nicolaus of Damascus, describing Caesar's assassination. Now, he's probably using um, a source. Peter Wiseman thinks it's um, Asinius Pollio. And actually, this is, a, this is a bit of the story of the assassination of Caesar. I checked various popular accounts, and indeed, quite reputable accounts of the assassination of Caesar and found that this little bit of the events on the 15th of March in 44 uh, is often overlooked, although it's not overlooked, I noticed, in the latest book by Barry Strauss. Um, but this is what Nicolaia says. Um, this is uh, fragment 130.26. So Caesar's been attacked. Not one of his many friends stood by him, either while he was being slaughtered or afterwards, except Calvisius Sabinus and Marcus Censorinus. And these, although they offered some slight opposition when Brutus and Cassius and their followers made their attack, had to flee because of the greater number of their opponents. Now, well, I've written quite a lot about this, and I'm not sure how much you want to hear um, uh, of the implications um, uh, of that episode, which, although it's often overlooked, I mean, how many of you knew about two senators trying to save Caesar? Yeah, well, it was new to me, I'm ashamed to say, um, and uh, uh, it's not well known, but I'm going to propose that part of this inscription, indeed, the main purpose of the inscription, is to make it better known, because all of the senators, and this is in a sense... Mark Antony, when he, when he makes that famous um, uh, speech of his, um, alludes to this, all of the senators had taken an oath of loyalty to Caesar. And any of the senators who attacked Caesar, it was a version of the, the, the oath that legionaries swore to their commander. They had all sworn to protect him. Only two senators acted on that oath an oath of piety. And of course, this is a period when Pietas, I mean, it's going to be uh, magnified hugely once Virgil uses it defined, to, to define uh, an epic character. But all the senators had ta taken an oath, pro, saluta, pro salute Caesaris, just a year before the assassination. It was, it was a sacrament. So the conspirators were obviously in flagrant disobedience of that and they were acting um, impiously in what they did. But actually, any senator who failed to attempt to save Caesar was also acting impiously, meaning that those two who did attempt against all odds, and obviously they, they stood no chance, um, uh, could, in a sense, be justified in boasting about their pietas and reading in between the lines of what Ronald Syme says in various books and articles, I think that's what he means. That's why this is such a remarkable inscription. Well, that's one um, object to look at in Spoleto. 
And then, um, as you wander around the museum, uh, take a look at this, which, um, apart from anything else, is it's an attractive portrait to look at. He's, uh, it's one of those things you see in a museum, and it, you're kind of drawn to it. Um, some would say it's got some veristic aspects to it. Um, others would say it's you know, just simply a good-looking uh, Roman. Um, it actually is displayed in the museum uh, next to uh, someone who I'm sure uh, many in this room will recognize, despite um, this uh, disfigurement, that this is you know, um, reckoned to be one of the um, early uh, images of Octavian. Uh, we know that Octavian was involved at Spoleto um, during his uh, uh, wars around Perugia. And um, although there's no inscription and there's nothing to say, but, I mean, but this, this is from the theatre at Spoleto, as is this. So this is not connected with that base unless that base has moved um, quite a long way away to the outskirts of Spoleto, which is where it was found. Um, but it's, it seems from the... <laughs> the rather scant archaeological context of this, that the two heads were found together and were displayed together in the theatre at Spoleto, which seems to have been rebuilt under the auspices of Octavian. So we're looking around for someone in Spoleto who might have been you know, worth commemorating at the, uh, in the theatre. And with due caution, the museum, with a question mark, says possibly this is Calvisius Sabinus, who was as we've seen, a big Patronus in Spoleto um, and a friend of Octavian's and in a sense there's no one else from Spoleto who could be involved with the foundation of the theatre. And um, interestingly, from our point of view, when this was excavated in the 1960s, the excavators thought, oh, it's Julius Caesar. And that double take, which immediately, I mean, that they mention that in the publication and then sort of don't take it any further, um, I think the museum record says, you know, has been likened to, to Julius Caesar. Um, but I'd like to just um, explore some of that reasoning with you um, as far as we can. I think we can see that it's not like, or it's not like Octavian or Augustus. You know, the, the hairline here is, um, uh, you know, it's not affecting uh, Augustan um, coiffure in any way. Um, it may have been Togate, there may have been, uh, it may have been Velatus, um, it's not quite clear from the um, work on the back um, where it was. I've put a question mark there, but I'm actually going to um, run past you, and there's more discussion here, which I don't think I've got um, time uh, to expand, but maybe if we've got time for questions later, um, you can quiz me a bit further on this. Some of the features, um, the... Uh, the hair, the arc of the brow, the nose, the mouth. Uh, I'll say a bit more about the um, uh, evidence for what Caesar's mouth looked like in a moment. Um, but basically, the excavators, when they said this looks, about, looks a little bit like Julius Caesar, were thinking of what Paul Zanker, Fleming Johansson, and others um, who've looked at Caesar's portraits consider to be the sort of... Um, the haupt typus, the, 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 the head, the head head, the head type, the head type, a haupt kopf, I think is, uh, we can do it in German as the head head, but not in English. The, the, the landmark Caesar is this piece from Tusculum, where of course you would expect, uh, you know, the sort of uh, ancestral area of the Julian clan, um, you'd expect um, a bust of Caesar. Not thought to have been done in his lifetime, but this is thought to be a marble based on a bronze, um, uh, probably executed very shortly after his death. Um, don't ask me what the reasoning is for that, but that's, um, uh, you go to Turin, in fact, you can't see it in the museum, but with special permission, you can, you can get down to the basement. Um, we're gonna have a look at more, more features of that in a moment, but, um, in terms of the hair and the brow, um, what you see um, in the head on Spoleto uh, is, uh, has some similarities. Um, and it's essentially the hair, uh, I mean, if anyone knows um, anecdotal evidence about Caesar's appearance, um, I think the one common uh, part of knowledge is that 
he was very sensitive to his, his receding hairline, and he, he sort of pulled his hair forward. Um, uh, I can't remember which of the writers, it's, it's either Dio or Suetonius who says, you know, he, he pulled his hair forward um, to disguise his, his boldness uh, um, at the front. Uh, and this is what you see with um, our man in Spoleto. And there's arrangement, which we could say more about, um, around the ears that um, is, is determined by the Tusculum piece. It's very frustrating. Um, a, a lot of um, authorities use a photograph of this. Um, when you get to Turin and look at it closely, you realize that it's really quite badly corroded marble. And um, that's frustrating in terms of you know, dealing it with, with it as the kind of lead portrait of Caesar. But there's just something about this piece which, um, so far as I'm aware, uh, I'm the first person, and it's very hard to be original in classics, I wanted to tell the MA students that, uh, to find something that hasn't been found before. Um, and I think no one has noticed this before, and possibly um, you've already seen what it is. That story um, from Nicolaus about what Calvisius and Censorinus did um, in the assassination attempt. If you know anything about the assassination, you know it was something of a melee. It was a bit like murder on the Orient Express. All of the conspirators had to leave a mark on Caesar. Yeah, that was part of their pact. And there's about 28 or 30 of them. They all had knives out. They were all panicking. Some of them hit each other accidentally. Um, very messy. You can understand how it would be very difficult for any of the senators to stop this because they, you know, there was no forewarning of it at all. Um, and I just noticed this and thought, I wonder, because I mean, certain scratches on the forehead look modern, but can you see what I've seen here? Um, this struck me, looking at it, as an ancient. This is, this is part of the portrait. And I, um, I'm going to suggest that that's part, I mean, it's a very small scar, and we know um, Romans like to boast about their scars, um, but I like to think it was a little uh, cicatrice um, incurred when the knives were flying and Calvisius was that, you know, one of that sacred pair who attempted to um, save Caesar. So it could have been worse, you might say, in terms of leaving uh, damage, but it's, you know, that was a scar that he had to show his pietas. Well, what does all this um, tell us? In a sense, I think it's it's a cautionary tale in the sense that it doesn't take very much to look like Caesar. I mean, assuming that from the prosopography, we've got a character from Spoleto, municipal, you know, provincial, but made it up through the ranks thanks to Caesar, who's got a good reason for wanting to look like Caesar. Um, I mean, provided you're clean shaven and you don't have a huge head of hair, um, and you're relatively lean, i.e. you're not chubby like Pompey. Um, all you have to do to look like Caesar is really just re get your hair cut short and bring it forward, and um, job done. And in a sense, this has caused a lot of the problems with Caesar portraits, because um, from about the 1880s, uh, you've got, um, well, one scholar, Bernoulli, uh, in his Roman iconography, counting something like 60 portraits of Caesar. They doubled um, over the early 20th century to 120, 130. And then Fleming Johansson came in and did a cull. And he culled it down to 20, which leaves quite a lot that are Caesar lookalikes. Some of them are um, modern. Um, Paul Zanker says this, he thinks, is... Um, it's done in a very strange green stone. Um, uh, it's been around for a long time, uh, since the 17th, 16th century. Um, he thinks it's one of Caesar's admirers from the Nile. I think it's one of Caesar's admirers from the 17th century. Um, when you get to a small scale, I mean, this is, you know, something you wear on, your, on a ring, um, you see what I mean about the, you know, with the hair and the... Um, and the profile, in fact, dealing with anything in profile, I think, is, is problematic. Um, I mean, since I've, I've got interested in this topic, um, I find rather gratifyingly that people send me 
images of things they think are Caesar, and uh, this was one I was sent um, uh, about a month ago from uh, the Allard Pearson Museum in Amsterdam by the curator there who's, who's working on a whole archive of these little clay seals from um, uh, uh, the temple at Edfu, which was destroyed um, in early in the first century um, AD. Um, and left all these all these things, and he thinks, you know, he says to me, do, do you think this is Caesar? And uh, I go, well, yeah, you, you know, it, it could join the sort of 130 um, possibilities, and it's, it ticks some of the boxes, but, you know, it's a very, on a small piece, you're really, it's a very reductive way of looking at this. Um, well, that hasn't stopped him. He says, well, I'm going to propose that Cleopatra commissioned a signet ring with her lover on it, and she wanted him to look good like this. So there we are. Um, but there, you know, you look around, and there are other people who ought, in a sense, to to fulfil this. No one has suggested this is a, a Caesar, but one can see that you know, with one of his kin group, uh, this would be um, would it be his brother-in-law, Calpurnia. Uh, anyway, I, it, it's, there's a, there's a there's a family connection by marriage. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful bronze. It's been in that bronze exhibition that's been going around the world. Um, but you can see even with, you know, uh, Caesar's brother-in-law, although his hair is a bit tufty, and it's certainly not, he's not receding his hairline, um, he's wanted to capture something of Caesar's um, appearance. Um, this uh, has also been mooted as a possible Caesar. And again, it's a sort of, you know, one of those cases where the provenance um, those of you who know this area, Rio Terra, you know, it's in that, the bay of, of Vaya. Uh, you can see the villa that is supposed to have belonged to Julius Caesar um, on the promontory. You would expect one of those families to be, um, uh, you know, have people who want to look like Caesar. And, of course, you've got possibly um, these holes here where Caesar's star the star, um, he was very superstitious, as um, I'm sure you know, um, would, would fit. And then you sort of look at the um, slightly sort of rosebuddy mouth, um, this arch of the brow, and you think, well, it's not really like the Tusculum portrait. And, you know, where is our fixed point here? Where, um, if this is Caesar, is that head from Tusculum Caesar? And you, so we, we begin to get into a bit of a quandary. Um, and as we get to a, a part three of this, I'm going to try and um, work out some way of resolving this. Um, but I couldn't resist just including this, because again, uh, someone said, oh, are you interested in Caesar? Then you ought to see what's on sale at Christie's. This was last week. Um, I did just check the sale catalogue, and it seems not to have sold. Uh, and I think that's anyone who looked at the provenance would have run a, run a thousand miles away from this. Um, it was bought by someone in New York who couldn't remember who he'd bought it from. It's funny that. Um, anyway, uh, it's got some modern work on it um, uh, around the nose and the mouth. Um, but th these things are appearing, and the Christie's catalogue, Julie says, um, it's one of those Romans who wanted to look a bit like Caesar. Um, and that's, you know, this, this Caesar Gazette becomes a very kind of accommodating category. Um, and I think, uh, I haven't spoken to Paul Zanker personally about this, but I think it sort of, it may come back to haunt him as a, uh, as a problem. And I think it is a problem which, um, which needs to be addressed. No one um, really has any um, doubts about what happened after the assassination as regards the portrait. The Senate declared Caesar to be a god, and once he is Divus Julius, and Michael Corbogian and others have explored this quite recently, um, you can really do anything you like with him. That is to say, well, up to a point, you, you can give him a bit more hair, because a god, you know, a human, a mortal who becomes a god can, can undergo a sort of metamorphosis. And anyone who reads Ovid knows that, that you can... Uh, you can rejuvenate if you um, uh, change from mortal to immortal. And so there is this type which um, is located in the Vatican and in Pisa um, of what Caesar looked like. And this, um, you know, the multiplications of this 
wasn't so long ago on that little island um, uh, at Pantelleria um, that uh, a whole cache of, of, of imperial portraits of the Flavian period was found, uh, and one of them you know, fitted this bill. This is how Julius Caesar, the deified Julius, was supposed to look like, um, and um, there are examples of this um, from various places. And in a sense, they're not problematical. You know, we know that Caesar deified can be the sort of, you know, the founding father of not only the Julian clan, but of course the, you know, the prototypical uh, capo stipite, the, 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 the founding um, imperial figure. <coughs> and in a sense, it's futile to ask the question, did Caesar really look like this? Because of course, once he becomes a god, that's something different. And, that he has that, that identity and that problem of, you know, the real face of Caesar does not exist anymore. Well, is there any way of working out how Caesar might have looked, let's say, at the time of his assassination? Well, there is one proposal uh, from um, a numismatist, uh, name will be familiar to some of you, uh, Andreas Alfoldi, who um, in a series of articles maintained that um, in the four or five years leading up to his assassination, Caesar took control of the mint in Rome in a way that had never been done before. He did something that had never been done before by any um, uh, Roman politician, and he put his face uh, on these coins. And again, summarizing uh, um, a subtle... Um, analysis uh, of coin issues and, and etc. Uh, Alfoldi said, this is das vara gesicht Caesar. This is the true face of Caesar. That's the title of one of his articles. And that again, you know, at first sight it looks, it looks promising because there are um, references in um, Suetonius that specifically mention that Caesar himself took control of the, the mint and the, he appointed his own people to produce coins. Um, the, the context of the issues leading up to his assassination, that's a funny way of putting it because obviously he didn't know about that, um, what he was aware of was that he was about to launch a big campaign in Parthia he was going to be away from Rome, a long way away from Rome for a sustained period. He needed to produce a lot of coins uh, and, well, one analysis of this is that it's not him pretending to be a king, as some would have thought. It's him really needing to assert an identity around which all of his supporters in Rome can, can kind of consolidate. And coins are the, you know, the obvious medium for doing this. So that Caesar produces a lot of these coins, he appoints his own people to produce them. And it's that phrase, you know, his, um, it was his staff who were producing these coins, the, and he, he increased their number, so they, they, they become the four moneying. Uh, their names are known. Um, I've got them somewhere in this text, but uh, in a sense that doesn't matter. But let's just have a look at some of their output. Um, and, well, I, I'd be interested to know what you make of this. Uh, I mean, I'm not a numis numismatic specialist. Again, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have people around me I can consult on these things. Um, what you make of this, I mean, you can date... Um, the coin issues quite precisely um, and you can get some fairly good close-ups of the images. And I'm just going to go through the, uh, Metius is one of the, the four that um, was appointed by Caesar um, to see what you make of these um, and then I might just leave this on the, um, on the screen, find the relevant bit of text because I think I think I've put it better than I can remember. Um, uh, yeah, here we go. This is, this is me looking at um, a page of Michael Crawford's Roman Republican coinage um, with, with a couple of numismatists uh, either side of me. The more one looks closely at the issues associated with Caesar's uh, four moneyers, Metius included, 
the more one begins to feel doubtful as to how far they can define the true visage of Caesar. On some, Caesar's neck is preposterously elongated. It's been likened to the neck of a giraffe. With half a dozen or more striations, um, now where are they there? Here we are. These things um, are called Venus rings, and men don't often have them. Uh, Caesar, uh, what have I put it here? I was rather proud of this. With half a dozen striations stacked up as if Caesar were an elder of the African Indabeli tribe. These are the people in South Africa who elongate their necks deliberately by putting rings around them. Some of them show him lantern jawed with merely a single groove. Um, these grooves in your cheeks, sorry, these grooves in my cheeks that are appearing um, are called accordion lines. And sometimes Caesar has uh, one of them and sometimes he has several. Signs of seniority have multiplied with corrugations across the brow. Caesar's nose may be straight and slanting, or it may be slightly aquiline. On some issues, the Adam's apple features prominently, on others, hardly at all. The hair to the front, or lack of it, is never easy to judge, since some kind of wreath or garland, um, there's some controversy about what that was, but we didn't need to go into that. Um, and the hair at the back is vari variable in length, thickness, and direction. So even if you allow, as Alfoldi did, that you know, when you, when you cut, d cut a dye, it degenerates as you use it, um, and it gets a bit sort of fuzzy. Even allowing for the fact that coin cutters necessarily have to make caricatures. You know, they have to load the face with certain details that are um, particularly conspicuous. I don't know. It seems to me that there are features here that don't stack up to what Alfoldi wanted. You know, it's, if you can't actually determine the shape of Caesar's nose from the coins, it seems to me you're on a losing bet. You, you can't claim this as this is what Caesar really looked like. Uh, I mean, would you agree from that? This is just a kind of prima facie. If you look at these, you know, I've got a few. I mean, look at this one here. Um, I'm not saying it's someone entirely different, but it's, it really is not, um, it's not really what one wants as a... Uh, as a convincing um, vara gesicht um, de Caesar. <coughs> to conclude, I well, I want to go back to the head from Arles, and really the um, uh, the preface to this is that um, there's a kind of you know looking at a portrait, and it's the port you know a portrait. By, by Rembrandt, a portrait by Lu Lucian Freud. I mean, we know that in antiquity, or I think we can be 99% certain, that nobody sat for their portrait in the way that we would understand this. You know, those of you who, who know about, for example, the work of Lucian Freud, you know, he, he wanted 80 to 100 sittings. From, you know, th this is hours and hours of an artist looking at someone's face and in that sense that Marcel Mauss would anticipate it, you know, trying to get to the real individual personality. You know, any of you who try to do a portrait, whether it's a drawing, it's even a photographic portrait, you, know, you can't just take a snap and, and think that it works. It, it requires observation. And it strikes, um, it strikes me that some portraits, in terms of the detail they're giving you, are more observed than others. I mean, I'm just showing, I don't want to sort of confuse the issue here, but um, basically where, wherever I put a question mark, um, it's me agree agreeing with, with the doubters that you know, this should be excluded from the, that quite you know, rarefied category, that does look like Caesar, whether it's the deified Caesar or the Tusculum type, and it's those two types that have kind of survived uh, the cull of, uh, of Caesar. Um, in a sense, there's not enough here to go upon. Uh, it looks promising there. That m matches the Tusculum thing, but you get around here. I mean, this, is, this is, says a lot about the problems we have here, the mouth, the shape of the mouth, because we're told that he had os planum, which some people say is a full mouth, i.e. full lips, or it's a wide mouth, or it's a mouth, and it depends how you uh, use your Latin, um, it's a mouth that was, believe it or not, kindly. 
you know, he, that Caesar had a sort of, you know, a streak of clemency in him, which was readable in his facial features. What is striking about the portrait from Arles, uh, and I will try and leave enough time for us to have some, some discussion about this. Um, has, has any, no, no one's, yeah, well, I, I do recommend going, I mean, Arles is a nice place to go to, south of France, uh, always is. The colony um, founded in 48 by BC by Caesar, and he had some family, or some uncle uh, of his was connected with Arles. Um, the French archaeologists, I say, they, they, they pull this out of the river, um, very close to where the museum at Arles uh, has been created. Um, and in their accounts of finding this thing, it's almost while it's still in the river, on the river bed, sort of, yeah, mon dieu, that's, that's Caesar. That's, that's a very, you know, it's a kind of almost um, uh, a gut reaction to this. Um, it's displayed in a very uh, prominent and I would say very advantageous way in a museum. But that aside, it's also one of those portraits, and one could say this about a number of works of art um, that are portraits, and Rembrandt's an obvious case in point. It gives that sense of the maker of the portrait having observed closely. There's a lot of detail to go on, and there's a subtlety about this portrait, I think, which, um, I mean, partly because of the erosion factor, the, um, the Tusculum one, we've got a, um, it's coming up. I mean, these are just some close-ups I took. Uh, and it's the sort of details around the eye, um, the bags under the eyes. Um, there's a lot of expression here. I'm afraid um, a crucial part of the nose, but in a sense, you know, the, the skeptics, um, Paul Zanker is one who says, you know, I'm not convinced by this. Um, uh, and for him, the nose is not quite right. But if you've looked at the coins and you realize that even the coin cutters couldn't decide on the shape of Caesar's nose, you realize that we are in very... Um, uh, difficult territory here, um, uh, indeed. Um, we're now back with the Tusculum type. Not a great, not a great um, image, but uh, can you see that? You know, if you are working on the basis of the coins, um, you've got at least two of these Venus rings, and this, I think, just says that you know there was a way that Caesar held himself that um, made his jaw prominent. Um, Zanka has described this expression as um, ironic. Uh, maybe it's the irony of convincing everyone that you're really a very merciful um, dictator. Um, who knows? Um, but you see from the Arl figure, and this for me, uh, if you know, some look at this and say, oh, no, he's, he's not thin enough in the face. Um, but of course, as all of us know, you can, you can wax and wane as an individual, and uh, there are times of your life when you're thin in the face and times in your life when you're not. Um, but what do we make of these? Um, I think there'll be someone here who says, well, you find those on Roman grave reliefs. You know, that's not, this is not the only example of sort of multiple uh, um, rings. Th these are both details of the owl head. But if one were working on the coins, and if you were accepting that the caricature of the coins is, is what it is, i.e., they've really picked out. In fact, I would say that's the common element in the coin image. Um, disregarding the nose problem, it's this, you notice. And it, it can, as I say, get ridiculously, preposterously exaggerated. Um, and in this case, it seems that uh, it's almost as if Caesar were posing and doing that tilt, which actually, you know, as it were, um, exaggerated this. And I'm going to leave you with the image of um, possible Caesar, and possibly the only image we have of him that is done in his lifetime. That's, I mean, I'm going to risk putting that out as an intuitive uh, um, judgment on that. Um, looking at the man who tried to save him, um, 
And I think, you know, the communality of these is, um, in a sense, it's entirely dependent uh, uh, on the prosopography. If you, if you want to look like Caesar, um, there are certain features um, you can pick up on. Uh, arguably, the expression um, here in terms of the frown of the brow, um, the, the, the arc of the brow, the way it goes across, um, it seems to me that anyone looking at the image of Calvisius Sabinus with a question mark could see, if they wanted to see it, that he might be some sort of friend of Caesar's. And it was believable that his pietas was almost like a sort of um, fraternal regard uh, for Caesar. Um, uh, so in that sense, I think the idea of a Caesar gesicht uh, works, but it does leave us wondering, as I say, about what Julius Caesar really looked like. And um, I'm just going to end with the possibly um, self-defeating hope that you go away from looking at all these uh, images of um, uh, the cluster around the name of Julius Caesar, feeling at least a little bit enlightened, um, if only about the problem of recognizing his features.